accessing this webina, you agreed to hold the above harmless from any loss you may incur as a result of information discussed in the media identified above. By accessing this webina, you agreed to be placed on our mailing list and receive our newsletter. Rest assured, we take your privacy very seriously and we will not distribute or sell your information to anyone. All right, so where are we? How's the market looking? Oops. There we go. Um, so uh, we were we were down further today, but we're getting better already. So things are not so bad. We got the what's missing? The Russell. Oh, there I see. It's not wide enough. That's because I uh, blew up the screen. There we go. So you know we're we're so so here, but you know what you want to start looking at is the daily looks. And as you can see, we're sort of faltering and, and sliding back. It's going to take a lot more than, than a little bit to uh, get off the slump that we're in right now. Uh, if the Russell starts breaking down, that would be a bad sign. You can see the Nikkei is bouncing off the lows. Europe's bouncing off lows. DAX is bouncing off lows. So, you know, we're just sort of doing a technical bounce right now. And it's the same crap, same lines as we had for the last couple of weeks that we've been watching. So nothing changing there very much. Oil still very toppy, over 80 bucks. Um, natural gas had a pullback. Gasoline really getting expensive. I'm sure you're seeing that at the pump, right? Bonds came way down, and that means that rates are going up. Lumber took off again. Look at lumber. From 450 to 750. It's crazy how this thing fluctuates. The whole year of lumber. Look at this crap. <laughs> it's it's so nutty when you consider like, you know, it's a pretty steady thing. They cut down X amount of trees and supply them and so on and so forth. This is really just about the spot pricing of lumber because there's an actual bottleneck in the shipping industry. So it's hard to get the lumber to places and therefore people are bidding up the price of lumber. because you, you can't build your home without the lumber. So a builder is going to, uh, you know, building economics is weird, right? So the builders have to go, okay, so I either don't make my, I either don't build this house and make zero money, or I spend an extra $25,000 and cut my profit. Let's say, I, let's say he was going to make 75000 now he's only going to make $50,000. It's not, you know, he'd rather make $50,000 and make zero. So he'll build the home, spend the extra, you know, spend extra money on lumber, and move it forward, move the project forward. That's what's going on. That's why the price of things like that can get out of control. Same thing goes for like things like coffee. Um, same thing goes for uh, um, sugar, right? Hershey's going to make a chocolate bar. They're not going to not make a chocolate bar because the sugar prices go up. They're going to make less money making their chocolate bars, but they're going to buy the sugar at whatever price there is. There are certain things where the price can get out of control very quickly because you have this incredibly large, steady, inflexible demand that is not going to cut back tremendously. And the thing is, you know, like, let's take sugar, okay? Um, uh, whoever it is, Mars, makes M&Ms, and they, are, they have peanuts in them, and they have chocolate in them, and they've got whatever you make the shell out of them, whatever. So you need cocoa. Um, Here's cocoa, you need sugar, okay, and you need peanuts, which is not a thing around here. Um, you need all that. Now, if any one of those things gets expensive, they're going to just keep making M&Ms. Now, they're not going to know demand for M&Ms is down for months because they make the stuff and they make it at the factory. They put it in the warehouses. The warehouses ship it out. It takes a long time before there's a feedback loop that tells them the consumer demand is off because we raised the price of M&Ms. Um, plus, you know they make a fortune on M&Ms because every time you go to like, um, you know, Walgreens or something like that, that they're always on sale, right? They're always like two for something. And then, and then even in 7-Eleven, they're two for something. It's like more often than not, M&Ms have sales. So obviously there's some kind of high margin things. So when the price of these things goes up and, and cotton now, right? You know, cotton has gone up tremendously in price. Um, 
And over the last year, look at that, it was 65 went up to 115, almost doubled in price. So how much of your shirt price is cotton? Well, not too much, really, because if you think about it, um, you know a T-shirt is five bucks, right? Like, you know you can buy a plain old T-shirt for five bucks. Therefore, that amount of cotton, the amount of cotton it takes to make a shirt is only, is less than $5 worth of cotton. So it doesn't matter whether it's a t-shirt or a dress shirt or any kind of shirt, whatever it is, it's, if it's made out of cotton, it's still using $5 worth of cotton. It's just that they weave it differently or do something different with it. But it's the same basic $5 worth of cotton either way. So if the price of the cotton goes up to $10, well, that affects the really cheap t-shirt market, obviously, right? Those guys are going to get pissed off. They're paying double for their shirts. But, um, but uh, the $50 dress shirt market, you know, the Izod market and things like that, all the sport, all the polos and things that are made out of cotton, you know, that, you know that's not going to, it's only, it's only plus or minus $2 worth of actual cotton. And that's not going to cause a big change in the flexibility. They're going to make $2 less per shirt. And this is how inflation works. This is why it's hard to pass on inflated prices. At first, the people who get killed by inflation are the manufacturers because you'll see the PPI going up faster than the CPI. And that's because they can't pass the prices along to the consumers that quickly. First of all, they're scared to. They don't like to do it unless the competition is doing it because you can price, you know, if you, if you become, if you're the first one to pass along a price increase, you can chase your customers to your competitors. And chasing your customers to your competitors is never a good thing. It doesn't matter. It's not temporary. You may, you may get them, you may teach them to like something else because you're taking away the thing they like, like Facebook, right? Like last week, Facebook was uh, chased everybody off the system because it wasn't working. And uh, people found other things to do with, with themselves. So, you know, to some extent, when you lose customers, you can have long-term losses. They're not gonna come right back when things go back to, to normal. So people are very reluctant to raise prices and change them. Once they do raise prices, there's a feedback loop from the consumers because you raise the price. First, the consumers will look for something else. We talked about the CPI measurements and, and um, um, the substitution index and the CPI, whereas if you, in other words, if you raise the price of uh, ribeye steak by two bucks, people will buy a New York strip steak, which hasn't had the price raised yet. They'll substitute the thing. So if you raise the price of peanut M&Ms, maybe because peanuts went up, people might buy plain M&Ms because they're still the same price because the price of uh, the other stuff didn't go up. Um, or vice versa, maybe you buy peanut M&Ms because the price of cocoa went up and the price of sugar went up, but the price of peanuts didn't go up. And peanut M&Ms have more peanut and less cocoa and sugar in a bag. Same weight bag, right? The bags weigh the same, but one's full of peanuts and one's not. <laughs> so. So one bag is like half peanut. Um, so people will substitute, your con your consumers will substitute, and they may substitute for another thing you sell them, or they may substitute away from your brand completely. But that price sensitivity, you don't really know what it's going to be until you get the feedback. And that can take quite a long time, because like I said, you're you know making your M&Ms, you put them into, you know, you've got these giant machines making millions of M&Ms every day and you put them in the bags and then the bags go to warehouses and the, uh, to distribution centers the distribution centers put it to regional warehouses the regional warehouses then send it out to all the 7-elevens or whoever the hell buys it as they, on the retail side um and uh, and then they have it on their shelves and then they either reorder or they don't next month so you don't really know until they reorder the stuff that you ship them and that to, to get to them might take a month before it's even in their hands. You don't know what's going on when you raise the price. It takes a long time to get the feedback. Um, so you have to think about that when you watch these commodities, who it's good for, who it's bad for. You know, if you look at Levi, right, who obviously sell a lot of cotton. So they've been getting hit recently and you can look at the chart. There's cotton going up and here's Levi going down because the assumption is Levi is going to have a hard time passing on an increased cotton price. They're going to probably absorb it. And then you go to look at Levi. And you know, this, this is what, 
you know, this is what investing is about. I'm not trading. This is investing. This is, you know, following a premise and saying, well, okay, well, if that's happening, then what about this? And what about that? Are we seeing this actually happen to them? Are we seeing repercussion? So the Levi company has been good for about 5 billion a year in sales. Last year, down quite a bit, 4.5 billion. They took a small hit last year. Generally, this seems, this seems a little large. Um, so I, I see here, I'd want to find out why is it that they did 5.5 billion here and made 283, they did 5.7, made 395. Now they're doing 5.7, but they're going to make 594. How, how have they, why, how, what have they done that they now make so much more money per sale? What changed? And if we figure that out, and now maybe, maybe it is because they did a lot of cost cutting here. And you, you know, sometimes companies do that. Like when there's a recession or something happens and they cut their costs, they, they then rebuild better. And, and an old company like Levi, and I have no idea what the case is, but I'm saying an old company like Levi, you could imagine has a, a, a lot of legacy stuff that maybe you would say, if you're an efficiency consultant, which is something I used to do, you might go into the company and say, hey, do you really need to do this anymore? Do you really need this? Do you need this kind of, do you have to have this program in place for your employees? Is that necessary? You know, you got to look at things that are wasting money that they don't need to cut costs on. They could be shipping things differently. They, and they're things that guys don't like to do, like they've got a shipper they've worked with for 20 years and they like them and whatever. But meanwhile, you could do better if you went to UPS and made use of a program. They've got a team of programmers of 50 guys who run their computer services in-house. But meanwhile, if they outsourced it to Amazon, they'd save like 60% of the money. Um, you know, these are the kind of things you look at, but then a lot of times the guy who runs, especially a long-term business guy, might say, eh, you know, you know, you know, yes, true, but, you know, we've been with these guys for 20 years and they're great and they, they're reliable and we like them. So you don't make those cuts, even though they could save the company money. But when the shit hits the fan and they're forced to cut everything back, all of a sudden they go down the list of all these things that have been suggested to them and start making the changes. And then all of a sudden, when they come out of the, uh, the, the, the the downturn, they suddenly go, hey, we're a lot leaner and more efficient now. That's why I look at this stuff, because I want to say, how, how badly does it affect you when you get hit? So you can see here, they went from 5.7 billion making 395, right? Making 400 billion. So they need, basically, you'd say they need 5.3 to break even, right? They're running their company at a cost of 5.3. And they make 400. So they need they need 5.3 to break even. Now here they are at 4.9, 4.4. They're about 900 uh, billion dollars. 900. I'm sorry, 900 million dollars. They're about 900 million dollars below what would seem to be the break even. Yet they only lost 127 million dollars. So that tells you a couple of things. First of all, it tells you they run on very thin margins in the first place. Second of all, it tells you though they were able to make a lot of cuts. You don't you don't drop nine hundred million dollars. You don't. I mean, in this, I'm sorry, it's not nine hundred million. It's one. You drop one point three billion dollars, which is about twenty five percent down here, and you do, and you only drop your profits by five hundred million dollars. So they're clearly not making. In other words, they're clearly not making five hundred million per one point three billion here. Otherwise, they would have a, a one billion dollar profit. So they found a way in this time. They made adjustments that stopped them from taking a very big hit, and they came through with with very uh, relatively light losses. I mean, one hundred twenty seven million dollars is not light losses, but it is it is half of a year's it's it's half a typical year's earnings or less, and that means it's quickly recoverable, right? That means if you amortize that over ten years, they're only down five percent per year. So you look at that and say, okay, this is a, a indications of and, and you want to read more and find out what they're doing and look at the reports but it's indications of a well-run company and as you can see um back in ah, stupid thing how is this five years this isn't five years oh i see who wants me to do that oh i don't like that okay so in 2019 they were up at 24 dollars Never really higher than that. If we go to all, I don't know what kind of view that gives us. 
Yeah, they really have been trading around here. This is this is their trading zone. It's like the low twenties is their general trading zone, but they're not the same company they were in two thousand nineteen. They're they're coming out better. They're making more money. They're doing well. So if I feel that solid and it's going to continue going forward, I say, ooh, I like these guys. So why are they down now? The sentiment is that cotton price is rising, going to impact their margins. There's no current indication of that. And then you want to go and say, okay, well, let's find out something else about these guys. Let's go check out when their earnings are, what their report says. All right, so here's Levi. Their earnings are uh, October 6th. Wait, that went by already. So they just had their earnings, so that's good. So now we can find out what happened. Oh, three big takeaways. How nice. How, oh, 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 where'd it go? What happened to it? Not that I trust anything the Motley Fool says, but. Um, So sales trends didn't disappoint. Profitability rose despite rising cost pressures. Exactly what I was getting the indication of from the sheet. And they're transforming their their business by widening their portfolio, pushing into e com, pushing into e coms. I mean, that's that's how you know slow this company is about things. Is they're only just now saying we could sell these things online. Look at how old those all look, right? Those it's brand new jeans. Um. <laughs> not only did they beat growth expectations, but they were able to boost profitability by raising prices. So they've done everything you need to do to get through this. Sales 41%. Who cares about last year? We should compare it to 2019. Ah, here you go. Sales up 3% compared to 2019. That's good reporting. Um, strong quarter, revenue growth, rising prices help manage production costs. Um, gross profit increased. Blah, blah, blah. Uh, they hiked their 2021 outlook. The forecast implies management sees no significant ch supply chain problems, cost challenges, um, investors can look forward. And now they're doing all this with very, very high shipping costs too. You got to keep that in mind. So all this is happening during a time when container shipping costs are through the roof. So on the whole, that makes these guys a pretty good uh, uh, a pretty good investment. They sound like a nice company to put some money into. Uh, there's certainly nothing bad about them. And so, like I said, you then you got to, th so now you, th but this is how you play cotton. You think of a company that's a, that's a good play on cotton and you say, well, okay, so who got hurt for this? And once cotton comes back down to, to normal prices and why wouldn't it? You don't have more people. I think one of the things you have though is you probably have a lot of people who haven't gone anywhere for like two years. And now that they're going back back out, one of the things they're doing is like, you know, geez, I haven't bought clothes in two years. I know I did that. I'm like, I haven't bought anything new in a couple of years. You know, so it's nice to have a couple of different things to wear. Um, so that's what you do is you, you know, you think of a premise that, that matches something, a trend you see, and you say, well, this was too high. Now, on the other hand, so 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 you know, and again, I'm not super excited about Levi or anything. I'm just saying it's just it's Something you look at and say, okay, now the cotton's calming down. Who's going to benefit? Levi's going to benefit. What can you do with Levi? And then the last step, of course, would be um, ah. so the last step would be theoretically, if it ever comes up. <laughs> So then we want to see if they have good options to trade. I don't think, uh, oh yeah, they go all the way out to 2024. So here's Levi's at 2450. And you can sell the $20 puts for three something. You know, let's say uh, 350, probably. Yeah, let's say, three, you know, if you can sell those guys for 350, the 20, the $20 puts, you're netting in for 1650. Uh, which is a really good price because it's 24.50 now. 
So basically 30% off. So your worst case is 30% off by selling the $20 puts. And then you set up a spread saying, oh, well, I think they're gonna recover now and uh, this should be the low. And if things go well, we can expect them to get up to back to 30. And you can sell the $30 calls for maybe 360, 370. And if you can, uh, if you can buy the 20, what, what were those, the 30s? So if you can buy the 23s for like 620, say 625, 630. So say 630 and these are 370, that's net what, 260? Is that right? Two, so yes, 260. So let's say that you do 260 on the $7 spread. That's a really good price. And you could pay for as many of those as you want by selling half of these things. Okay, so you sell, you sell half of these calls. So let's make sure we got the math right here. We've got the uh, 23, which we said would be 630, 6.30 uh, minus uh 370 we said here right so minus 3.7 is 260 and let's say we did like 20 of those would be 5200 and then let's say we sold 10 of the 20 dollar puts but what do we say 350 so minus 3500 so that would be 1700 dollars and we would buy 20 of the 23 30 bull call spreads. So that would be $7 spread. So it's $14,000 worth of spreads for 1700 bucks. And your worst case is you would end up owning a thousand shares of Levi's for, um, what do we say, 20, for 20 plus the dollar 70, so for 2170. So that becomes your worst case scenario is that, is that you own them for 2170. So that's not bad. And that, and that, so that way, I mean, rather than playing the futures, that's how you can play cotton prices to come back down. You just say, okay, let's play Levi to come back up. Let's assume their cost goes down. They've already passed through the price increase. People seem to accept it. And worse comes to worse, so put some things on sale later on. But the company should do well. Oh, another nice thing about Levi, by the way, is of course they're Levi's. It's not like it's not an easy substitution and people don't buy jeans often enough to change their habits based on it. If it was, um, if it's Exxon and Exxon puts a nickel on the price of gas more than their competitors, people will eventually start going to Chevron. You know, if, it, if the other guys don't follow suit, they'll go to Chevron. If you're buying Levi's and they're a dollar more than, than Lee's, you're not necessarily going to make your choice based on that. People have, you know preferences and they don't buy them often enough for it to be impactful to their spending so they're not likely to change it's like it's like if you have sony tv and sony raises their price a hundred bucks compared to the toshiba tv and people don't really look at a tv that way you're buying a thousand dollar television you don't really think about like you know well it's only this or that you people buy based on features and things that way back it's a one-time purchase otherwise otherwise everybody would always buy the cheapest thing which obviously doesn't happen um, so we talked about that. And then the same thing goes for, uh, for the cocoa, you know, things that, you know, when you see things that are, that are going up, you have to think about how long lasting is this? Oh, and so, like I said, the cotton demand is kind of driven by the reopening and not necessarily by any kind of long-term trends that say we're going to use more cotton from now on. So it's the shipping problems and the reopening and the fact that companies like Levi's aren't going to make their jeans out of something else. They want to sell the same amount of jeans. They have no choice but to buy the more expensive cotton. And that's what gives you this kind of demand spike. But over time, it's very, very hard for commodity surges like this to stick because basically people are just plant more cotton. It's now more profitable to plant cotton. And then you end up with a surplus. And if anything, it tends to go the other way after a while. Uh, although look at this, right? And it's funny because nobody made a big deal about this when it happened. You know, this is a, this is not a, a thing people notice, but it pay, you know, cotton is subject to price spikes. So is, so are all these commodities, coffee. We just had a general, you know, commodity boom over here. This was the same thing though. It was after the crash in 2008, we had this boom cycle. So this can go on obviously quite a lot longer if it mirrors what happened then. 
But you know the difference is is this was natural. You know, we had we had tarp and stuff, but it wasn't a huge stimulus package like we had now. This was an unnatural save. So it's I don't think we're gonna get that kind of spiky thing going on there. Now lumber was really weird though, because I mean lumber just doesn't, you know, doesn't do that. Um there's sugar too. So, you know, eventually over time, things go back to trend and you match that up with things you want to buy. And you just have to investigate and follow through and think about it logically. What's going to make money in the next cycle? Jeez, 130 already? <laughs> uh, what was I going to say? Or something, uh, I don't remember. Anyway, so... You know, the Fed minutes coming up. Oh, how'd the uh, auction go? <laughs> 30 year auction. Da, 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 da. September 9th, that's not now. <laughs> Twenty-four billion of bonds. October twelfth, and say thirteenth. Yeah. Two-year notes went to an eighteen-month high. <laughs> Maybe there's an update. They will open auction off. This happened already. Why is it saying will? Six month bid to cover Forex Live. Treasury. Okay. Ah. See, this deal is take. See, they took less, significantly less. Um, bid to cover. 2.36, so it was covered though. Direct was a little bit low. Indirect, that's the Fed stepping and they took more um, versus six month average of 72%. Auction grade B plus. Treasury auctioned off 24 billion. Um, that can pay favorably. So they got their price, but the, it doesn't count because the Fed did it. Uh, foreign demand was strong at 70%. Oh, I'm sorry, foreign demand is 70%, sorry. So that's actually good. Domestic demand was weaker, six month average, deals of shadow was small. No, notice it's all being bought by foreigners, all right? 70% foreign. Deals of shadow was small, 12.9% issue versus an average. And the bid to cover was not stellar, 236. And there's less domestic demand. So low, so I guess because we have, uh, again, we have 6% inflation. People don't want to buy a note for 2.2%. It's 2.04. 30 years, you're lending them, you're lending the government 30 years money at 2.04. But foreigners are doing it, but they're doing it because they're they got negative, they have negative yields in other countries. So this is a good deal for them. And what is it? J and K is like the uh, junk bonds, right? How's that looking? That's just, you know, basically that index is going higher and higher on the junk yields. Let's see how that ends up. So today we were talking about um, earnings are coming in good so far, but if you, you know, I'm not trying to be super picky. Um, JP Morgan moved $2.1 billion into profits because they they reduced their loan loss reserve. So in other words, they had, they had conservatively estimated that they would need a certain amount of money for bad loans. As it turned out, they didn't need as much as they thought for bad loans. Therefore, the money they had reserved for bad loans is now profit. Um, so it's also where they move their taxes around. They do this all the time, banks. Um, so, they showed growth, but the reality was without this 2.1 billion, they've got no profit growth at all. Um, a lot of banks do that, and you got to watch out for, for those when they're reading their earnings. Delta said, um, Delta did okay, 
but they said they're very worried about the rising fuel costs and it's starting to impact their margins. So I don't know how they ended up for the day, given that information. Yeah, so they, they're getting punished, 5.7%. And JP Morgan, oh, also getting killed. Wow, that's a big, that's a big drop for them. So, so both of them are suffering for their earnings. And that's, you know, again, this is what we're worried about. We want to pay attention to these things and see how everything's being taken. Talked about the money to our portfolio. And this is, I mean, look, the, let's start at the end because the end of this is important is we have, um, first of all, we don't touch this portfolio. Okay, we only play it when we're on the TV show. So therefore, like once a quarter, we'll make adjustments to this portfolio. Otherwise, we just leave it alone. Despite that, we're up 100%. Okay, so the portfolio has gained 100% despite the fact that we never touch it, that we don't adjust it. We don't, if something happens, we just sit there and watch it. If the stock goes up, stock goes down, if there's news, we don't react to anything because we don't make a move unless we're on the show and, you know, either... We have good timing or bad timing. It's random. So therefore, the picks are things that I think are pretty bulletproof. It's a great portfolio for that. These are all stocks I think are, you know, come hell or high water, nothing bad should happen to them for the next, for the next three months. Um, and not that it never does. I mean, things cycle through, but I mean, nothing, nothing that can be recovered. So the point is, though, that given where we are now, first of all, we only have $32,000 worth of uh, positions, okay? There's margin required, but it depends if you have portfolio, margin account or whatever, but not much, frankly. It's not, not a huge margin portfolio. It's 32,000 worth of positions, 167,000 in cash. And um, it's only six positions and the six positions uh, have the potential to make $109,000 between now and January, 2023 a really simple portfolio you you can start this portfolio anytime because these positions right here now cost thirty two thousand nine hundred dollars plus whatever margin from the short puts There's, i don't think we have any open any margin otherwise and you can turn that into this is profit not how much it'll be you can turn that into a hundred and forty one thousand dollars in 16 months So, you know, and, and again, this is without touching it. This is just leave it alone and see if it comes through. So how good are these positions? We have Boyd Gaming. And we like Boyd Gaming because of the, of the um, sports betting and things like that. That's a trend we think is going to stick around. In fact, we have two, two things betting on that. We have IGT too. Oh, no, I'm sorry. We don't have IGT in this one. That was a different one. We have Boyd Gaming. In this one, we have Boyd Gaming. Uh, we have IGT in the future is now portfolio, but it's the same logic. Um, and what's our spread on Boyd? It's a 55-75 spread. We sold the $50 puts. Those are way out of the money now. And we sold the short-term 75 calls, but only five. We sold made a one-quarter sale of the, these of these calls. But why do we do that? Because We bought these in September, so not too long ago. Um, and we paid 31.1 minus 15.8 minus 6690. We paid $8,600 for, for this part of the spread. Then we said, okay, now we're going to try to make back that's $8,600. So I said, well, why don't we sell the $70 calls? They're nicely out of the money. We don't think. Boyd will go much past 70 between now and January. And this was only, you know, this is on the 1st of, the, of uh, September. So about a month ago, we said this. So I was like, well, I don't think they're going to go much, much past 70. And even if they do, we got plenty of time to roll it. And we're only selling five out of this. So by the time it gets to 70, this spread would be $15 in the money, $30,000. And again, we only paid 8,600 for the spread. So no reason to fear 
this thing going up. So why not take 1850? Because now if we subtract 1850, now we only spend 6760 for the spread and we've got all the way until 2023 to sell it. So we could sell, um, this was a three month sale, let's say. We could sell four more three month sales at 1850 and we could wipe out the entire price that we paid for the spread. We can turn this into a zero cost spread, still a $30,000 spread. I'm sorry, $40,000 spread, $40,000, $20 spread. Um, so that makes perfect sense. Target-wise, I said $40,000. So target-wise, we're looking for Boyd to get to 75. It's been to 70, and we thought the sell-off was kind of silly. We think the sports betting wave and the money will come in, and it's a new revenue stream. We don't see any reason they're going to lose their old revenue stream. We think the new revenue streams coming in are going to be very beneficial for Boyd. The reason I like Boyd is they're um, – they have the smaller casinos. If you know Station Casino in Las Vegas, um, they they run those they run those like local kind of casinos that are really really popular with the locals. Like they're the places people go to. Uh, you know the steady customers going to gamble and drink and have a nice cheap night out. You know they're not fancy and they don't make their money off the hotels. They make all their money off the gaming, which is quite a lot. You know the gaming is very lucrative. Um. So this this has huge upside potential. It's already at eleven nine fifty now, so it's up five thousand something dollars for us already. And uh, it's gonna and 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 that's nothing because it's gonna make twenty eight thousand more more dollars. And all it has to do is just keep going along this trend line. This trend line took it from fifty five to sixty five in three months, four call it four months, and we've got twelve more months to go. It can it can grow at one quarter of the speed and we'll be in great shape. And then we want to look at some of the particulars on Boyd. And, and I'll show you why I like them. See, unlike the casino hotels, they don't have that huge overhead drag. So they were able to keep their costs in line. Only lost $135 million last year. But now they are coming back hard and fast with the new revenue streams. This is a void, isn't it? Yeah. And and the market's not catching up with it because they're being valued at 7.5 billion. If they're making $500 million a year and they're only valued at 7.5 million, that's like a, a 15 PE. So they're very reasonably priced. And um, and we think that the trend for sports betting is going to be uh, a catalyst. Don't forget, even if it's only a couple of year trend, they're going to for a couple of years make some really good money. That's actually that's the term of our bet. Even if sports betting is a fad and it just brings a wave in, what does it do? Obviously, um, all right. I I live in Florida. We have casinos. I do not currently. Well, I don't go at all because of the COVID. I mean, I, I used to play poker before before COVID. I would play poker a couple of times a month. I would go down to the casino and play some poker. Um, now, though, if you can bet on football, if there wasn't COVID and then, and, you know, people, there are people who will be more likely to go out than others. But my friends and I, and, uh, around here, we would certainly go to the casino on a Sunday and go watch, you know, like, like you do in Vegas, like you sit there and, with the sports book and they got a hundred TVs and you watch all the games that are going on at the same time and you make bets on the games and you have drinks and then you play some poker too. So for me, that's a great day out with my friends. That's a new source of revenue for the casino. That's me, people I know, coming in, doing something we didn't do before, spending money at their casino. That's why, that's why their revenue projections are jumping up. They expect a lot more turnover to come in. So, and I believe it. And I think that's, I think that's correct. And I think they're, being, they're, they're not being appreciated valuation-wise in the marketplace right now. So... We think it's realistic expectation. We think it's realistic gains. So that's a great, 
Uh, oh, I know, we're reading it off this, that's why. So that's why we like Boyd. Barrett Gold, well, obviously, we, you know why we like Barrett Gold. Um, that gets us to the metals. And so what do we know about gold? Well, for the last five years, up until 2019, Gold's been twelve, thirteen hundred dollars. Now it's seventeen, eighteen hundred dollars, and it's testing two thousand. I think it's consolidating for a move higher. I don't think this inflation is going away. I think gold's going to gain in value. Um, yeah, based on today's CPI number, it's up thirty-five bucks. So, or is that for the week? That might be a weekly number. Is that for the week or the day? No, that's a daily number. Okay. So, so yeah, well, let's see today's actual spike. See today's so they're up, they're, they're popping up thirty five bucks. But I just don't, I don't see this happening again. Well, not this, this. I don't see this coming back anytime soon. So therefore, Barrick's making more money now. You got to look into them and say, well, how, you know, what are their costs now, and so on and so forth, and then what's their all-in cost for the gold, and how much it costs them to extract it, blah, 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 blah. Um, I'll tell you one thing that happened to them is they, they merged with Newmont, and Newmont has much, much higher cost, um, average cost per, to, uh, to extract the gold. So until Barrick, Barrick used to be by far the lowest cost producer of gold. They still are, but new, but, uh, Newmont really screwed them up. So now they've got to diversify. They've got to get rid of all the um, all the less profitable mines, and it's going to take quite a long time until they get back to normal. Uh, but they will eventually. And the bottom line for these guys is, don't forget they combine now, so it's a different company. That's why you see this jump here. So this is all. This is what Barrick used to do, and they used to make 1.4 billion. Four billion dollars, two billion. This is a uh, transitional years, and now they're making two billion dollars. But they're going to start having more and more efficiency. But still, at two billion a year in profit, you're only paying thirty-three billion for the whole company, and this will grow. So I love them long term, and that's and that's by the way, assuming gold is only at this price. If gold goes to a higher price, it's all profit. That's the interesting thing about miners is at the anticipated price of gold, which is um, 1,700 bucks, let's say, then this is their profitability. But at 1,800 bucks, every single ounce they sell, which is about 5 million a year, makes another $100. So that's $500 million a year of additional profit if the price of gold goes up 100 bucks. That's big impact. So if there's some serious inflation, these guys will rise rapidly in price and it becomes a great inflation hedge. So in other words, it's a good company in the first place. It's a good operator. They're going to make steady income year after year after year. You can count on these guys in your portfolio. And there's a bonus that if inflation takes off, these guys will suddenly make incredible amounts of money. So that's why we like. Them. And then we go back to the actual position, blah, blah, blah. And what were we at? We were at, we were only looking for 27. So we have the 15, 27 spread. And that's where we're sitting with that one. So we think that's realistic too. Currently, it did, it did not make any money, right? That's uh, 49, 5,000 down, 5,000 up. It's basically flat. It's pretty much right where it was. And this upside potential is 26, it's only it's only net 35.50 to buy this position, and the upside potential is 26.450. All right, and we're right at 20 bucks. And what's our risk here? What do we do? Um, we have the $15 calls, therefore we're five dollars in the money times 25, we're twelve thousand five hundred in the money. It's not really at 20, but you know, if we're at 20, that's where we are. And um And we sold a $23 put, so we risk being assigned to 23. If th that's not a terrible thing, so there's not a particularly bad downside. Where we're technically we're four dollars in the money times 25, so we're ten thousand dollars in the money on our 35.50 spread. 
but we need to clear 23, which is where we'll be assigned. But of course we can roll that, so we're not too worried about it. And it's only a thousand shares. We'd like to own a thousand shares of Barrick. I don't have a problem with that. Because if we own a thousand shares of, of, a, of Barrick, what are we gonna do? So if we're forced to buy a thousand shares of Barrick at 20 bucks, at 23 and it's at 20, what do we do? Well, we sell the $22 calls for 250. And then we bring our net down by 250 and now our net is $20.50. Very simple. So this is a good steady, again, that's what this portfolio is all about. Good, steady, solid plays that are, are very easy ways to make money and, and good amounts of it. Hewlett Packard, uh, also another one stupidly cheap at the moment. Um, it's net 47.50 for the 47.40 for this spread at the moment. The upside potential is $24,000. This is crazy, and I and I think that was a pretty low target too. Um, target is thirty five for Hewlett Packard. So we think, see, here's thirty five. So we think that Hewlett Packard can get back to here. Why are they down? Temporary reasons is why they're down. Supply shortage, chip shortage. Are people no longer buying computers? No, that's not the case at all. There is currently supply constraints. There are currently chip shortages that are causing them to not be able to maybe make as much money as they could, but long-term investment, yes. Even if they don't get back in this cycle, they will eventually make the money for us. That's the kind of trade we wanna be in. Now, Pfizer, I would not enter as a new trade right now. I do a totally different trade. But Pfizer's in pretty good shape. There's nothing wrong with Pfizer. It's just that we came in at a, at a crazy low price. Otherwise, we wouldn't leave this in. Um, <laughs> somehow. I said in the next portfolio review, I think of the future is now. I'm like, I, you know, what every portfolio we have has some power in it because it's just so freaking good. You talk about a trend. How do you not play the trend of solar power? How, how can you imagine the world 20 years from now and not imagine much, much more solar power than there is right now? You know, it's gonna be solar everything. It's going to be uh, probably, down the road, it's gonna be probably about half of our, of our energy is gonna come from solar, maybe more. If they make solar power more efficient, then, then it's gonna be a very good portion of our total energy. Um, and all these companies, it's 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 going to be you know it's going to be like shooting fish in a barrel. They're all going to jump up. They're all going to make money. So this is this is to me uh, beyond a no-brainer. I mean, I can't believe I can't believe it sat here all this time below um, below twenty-five dollars. Once it got below thirty, we started buying it. I mean, below thirty was already crazy. I went down to twenty and and stayed around twenty for most of the year. That's just insane. All right, there's no logic to that. I mean, how do you bet against a trend that, that that's that strong? That's like betting against electric cars, right? I mean, so, you, know, you look at electric cars and you say, okay, uh, I'm going to bet on gas cars for the next 20 years. It's like, no, that's they're definitely in decline. It's a fact. Gas cars decline, electric cars go up, uh, alternate uh, traditional energy sources will go down, solar power will go up in many many ways now the reason i like sun power is they've always been the trendsetter they've always been on top of stuff they've always been the kind of company that's innovated and, and they've got the most efficient cells and so on and so forth they're they're kind of like the intel of solar and that's why i've always liked them and um you know so and 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 they've got good management they're strong they've been they've maintained a, a, top, a leading position all these years and people are just throwing money at solar some of it's going to rain on sun power and they're not that big for all for all that. There's there's nobody's that big in solar at the moment, but they're but they're going to be. So you know you have a, a solar industry that has a total market cap of maybe fifty billion dollars in a in a multi-trillion dollar energy sector globally. 
and 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 it's going to go the opposite way. At some point down the road, the fossil fuels will will shrink to ten percent, twenty percent of energy, and and solar and other and other renewables are going to be the rest. And you think of growth like that, and you look at where we are today, and it's it's a no brainer, it really is. You know, on any given month in any given year, do you know where it's going to be? No, but the long term. It, it's you know it, it really is just like pick three and you know pick three solar companies that have you know it's got to be the kind that do that that really consistently make profits and know how to make money though that's the trick you can't just pick anybody you can't pick Jinko Solar or something like that you have to pick ones that have a serious business and and run it a certain way um, like freaking Elon Musk with his garbage you know it's just it's it's a kind of bullshitty kind of solar but anyway so the bottom line is. Um, it's a $15 spread. It's basically fit. We're 50% of the way there on our spread anyway. Um, and all it, and in this case, this is what's crazy about the options on this spread though. Look at what we did on the spread. We bought the $15 calls and you can do this right now. Bought the, we bought the $15 calls. We sold the $25 call. So it's $10 spread and we paid about four bucks for the $10 spread, right? Against that, we sold the $20 puts for six. So then you take, uh, but it was only a one third sale. So that knocks $2 off the price of each of these. And how many, what did we say that was? That was a uh, $4 spread. So we, we ended up doing a $2 spread on, a, I'm sorry, two, we paid net $2 for a $10 spread when we originally took this position. Um, so that's where we are. But the spread is a 15.25 spread because we did it. We did it quite a while ago. We did it back in May when it was super low. Um, it's a 15.25 spread. We had a very conservative target. If I was doing it again now, I'd do a pick a much higher target, of course. But back in May when it fell, we took full advantage. And we picked up the spread for, for net $2 because we sold the puts saying, I don't think it's going to go any lower than this. And we picked a target. We bought these calls, 15s. We sold the 25s. And that netted us in for 2 bucks. And all it has to do now is stay above 25. And we're going to make an $8 profit on, a $2, on $2 that we put in. That's 400% on our original investment we're going to make. We're halfway there. You can still make 100%, and all this stock has to do is not fall below 25. On that spread, you will pay much more money than we paid for it. We paid 3,000, it's now 7,000. But you can make $8,000 more, $7,900 more than it is today. That's crazy. That's how options work. You know, when you when you find the right stock with a good amount of volatility and it has to have the kind of it has to have bets against it and so on and so forth. But when you find the right stock with good premiums and you can put a combination like that together, it's crazy not to play it. They're going to pay you more than 100 percent if this stock stays above 25, if a solar stock one of the leading solar stocks on the planet has a good year next year with Joe Biden as president and all the other leaders of the world sitting there at the UN saying we must prioritize alternate energy. Global mandate. This, this is like buying a defense contractor at the beginning of World War II. It's like, duh, it doesn't matter which one you pick, they're going to make money. Everybody has to, they're going to use all of it, right? At the beginning of World War II, it's like, how many weapons are we going to need? All of them. <laughs> so any, any contractor who is, has, has weapons that haven't been bought yet will sell them eventually. There's not enough to go around, and that's where solar is now. There's not enough solar in the world to supply what we what we want to do. So everybody who does make solar will sell out all of their stuff and will get higher prices for it. We're at this super early stage. It's again going back to 
the old days when there were 50 different memory makers, right, for computers and, and chip makers and things like that, and everybody bought everything. It took a lot of years before everybody, you know, people fell by the wayside and a few guys start to dominate, like Intel, AMD, whatever. But before that, Intel was still there, AMD was still there, but you didn't know who, you didn't know for sure who was gonna win this thing. And there were 10 other companies, um, SanDisk, remember SanDisk? Um, there were other companies that were seen as very large competitors in the space. But why? Because it was growing so fast that everybody sold everything and they all look good. You have to be careful in situations like that, not to be fooled into thinking you've got a unicorn when all you have is a horse with a spike in his head. <laughs> you know, you got, you got a horse who had a tragic accident, not a unicorn. Um, but that's beautiful. All these trades, I, I, I'm telling you, it's a fantastic portfolio. <laughs> these are all great stocks. And then Viacom, oh my God. I, I, I'm I just dumbfounded by this one. I don't understand math or something. I mean, this thing has been dead since April. It's hovering around 40. Um, I think this is another one of those things where it doesn't actually have to go up much. Uh, 45. We're shooting for 45. Um, we sold the 35 puts. It's at 40, so all it has to do is stay at 40, and we're going to make $10,000 back. And the net of this thing is 22 minus 11 is 11. Oh, it's 11,000. So basically, we're at we're even where it is right now. If it expires at 40, we're about break even on the net cost. Now we we came in for a lower price, of course, so we're profitable. But the net cost now is roughly ten thousand dollars, right? Because this is eleven, just under twenty-two, and that's twenty-two. So the net cost is about ten thousand dollars, and at five dollars, this is ten thousand dollars. This is a. Oh, I'm sorry. No, that's not true. I'm wrong. At forty, this is a twenty thousand dollars spread. I apologize. This is this is a uh, thirty thousand dollars spread, fifteen. But we're at forty, and so this would be twenty times twenty is forty thousand. Is I'm sorry, ten. This would be twenty times ten is twenty thousand dollars. So currently, this is twenty thousand dollars out of thirty thousand. We're twenty in the money, but you can buy it for ten. Okay, just let that sink in. Your risk is that you have to pay $35 for Viacom, but of course you will roll that put and pay less. But your risk at the moment is you're obligating yourself to buy 10, 1,000 shares of Viacom at 35, it's currently at 40. Not a huge discount, but a discount. The spread though is we own the 30s and we sold the 45 calls, it's at 40, therefore we are uh, 20,000 out of 30,000 in the money, yet, you only have to spend 22, 1, minus 7700, minus 4250, $10,150 to buy a spread that is, to be exact, $18,000 or $18,300 in the money. That's insane. That's how options work, though. That's why options are great. So on the whole, though, you're paying 10150 Oh, I said that here at 18. So 10150 and we have 19,000, 195% upside potential overall. But you have a, a very close to 100% upside potential if it just holds freaking 40. And we'll do this again. We'll take a look at these numbers. Viacom. And you know, this is the Paramount Network, this is CBS, this is uh, MTV, this is uh, um, Showtime and stuff like that. This is, you know, this is, this is stuff you're watching. This is something you're paying money for right now. So they're at $25 billion at, at 40 bucks and they're making $2.6 billion a year. And these are subscription revenues pretty steady stuff gonna grow over time it's very boring and very consistent it'll go up over time sometimes they can have a good year or whatever you ignore it but basically they're good for this money they're good for 2500 that means you're paying 10 times earnings for this company with growth 
In fact, profit growth, 11.4% on the average. Revenue growth, 14% on the average. You know, operating margin, 18.6% is actually pretty good. So, you know, there's nothing wrong with these guys. They've got plenty of money. They've got, oh, they have all the Star Trek. I like that about them too. They have all, they own all the Star Trek properties. Um, so they've got movie potential. And this is what they're doing. Oh, that's the other thing I love about them. They made two and a half billion dollars last year in a freaking pandemic. I love this company. They didn't even lose money. They, they're being given no credit for what they for what they're doing. I mean, this is a great solid company, and they're not into crazy shit like Disney is with the parks and the stadiums and the sports. And the, they, they don't do that as much. They're they just run their thing. They they put on entertaining shows. That's what they do. They stick to the knitting more or less. Um. So I I I love it. I don't understand how people are not buying this thing. They pay a nice dividend too. They pay, um, I forgot that they pay a nice dividend. Um, where the hell is Yahoo? There we go. <laughs> dividend, two and a half percent. So they pay, they pay about a buck a share in dividends as well. Not, not, not enough to make us want to own it, but still, they're paying a dividend. That means they have flexibility on the, on the money. Their cash flow is fine. They make, look at the PE ratio, 7.38. That's crazy, guys. Nobody wants it. How is that? How does this happen? How does nobody want this stock? What kind of crap are people buying that they don't want this? So weird, right? So there you go. So you can see, I love all of these picks. They're great. You can take one of them, you can take all of them, they all stand alone. And that's because these are the kind of picks where I say, I can get on TV and put my ass on the line and say, I like this stock. This is a great stock, buy it here. And I'll come back three months from now and we'll see how it's going. And I'll come back three months after that and we'll see how it's going. And by doing that, and we barely, ever touch these positions it's very rare that we adjust these things even because these are set and forget things it's of course they are right because where are we of course they are because i only need viacom to go to 45 what do i need to do i need to make my play in may and i need to relax what do i do with sun power i make my play in uh also in may and relax. What do we do in Pfizer? We make a play, we relax. Hewlett Packard, make it relax. Barrett, make it relax. Don't make a lot of changes in these things. Void Gaming, we just made it. What do we have to do? Nothing. The only thing we have to do is sell more calls when these calls expire. That's how you make money. It's not that hard. It's just, it, it, these are not exciting trades, but <clears throat> you should be excited about making a, a, what was the number? It's a big number. Ah. <clears throat> yeah, 300, you should be excited about making 331% on the cash. That's exciting. The rest can be boring. Just, just focus on the cash. And the other nice thing about it is you don't have to stare at it all day. Go have a life. Put some money into the positions. Go and enjoy yourself. That's how you invest in things. You're not supposed to be trapped by your investments. You're not supposed to be sweating over every move the market makes. These are all good, fine positions. And if there's a downturn, we are thrilled to take some of that sideline money and there's a lot of sideline money. There's 160 something thousand dollars, right? 167 thousand dollars of sideline money. So we're thrilled to take that. Double down. Do, will I double down on this? If the, if the market drops 50 percent, will I put 32 thousand more dollars in to have double the amount of these positions? Of course I will. And how much would that leave us? We'd still have 132 thousand dollars in cash. 
and then we'd have twice as many positions that would have twice as much upside potential if the market recovered. Obviously, we would roll down in price, we would move a year, whatever, but conceptually, do I still want this if the market crashes? You know, again, I'm not talking about if Boyd particularly does something really bad or whatever, but if the market crashes and drags everything down, what, what, what don't I want to double down on? And if I don't want to double down, it shouldn't be in this portfolio because I can't do anything with the position until I'm on TV. So I have to be able to ride out whatever bullshit the market throws at me, which means every position in this portfolio has to be one that I would be thrilled to double down on. And then, and then wait for the next cycle to come back. But, you know, so that's, that's why I put out a top trade alert on this thing today. And that's why I was talking about in depth today. Because it's just something you got to, <clears throat> you, you know, you got to realize there's always things to buy. And it doesn't have to be uh, some hot stock you read about or anything like that. None of these companies are trendy. They're in trends, but they're not the kind of companies that you would say, oh, I got to pick that because they're, they're the new hot thing. Boring, Viacom, Boring, Sun Power, Old Time Solar, Pfizer, Pharmaceutical, Hewlett Packard, Jesus Christ, the original computer company, um, Barrett Gold, uh, just a classic miner, Boyd Gaming, little casino company, doesn't build flashy stuff, little basic casinos that everybody goes to, that all the locals like to attend. Those are our picks. But the exciting thing about it is making 300% over the next couple of years. Not of this total portfolio, but 300% of, of the cash we have in play. We will deploy more cash if the market looks good, if more bargains come up. Um, you know, it's just a question. In fact, I do. Basically, every time I go on the show, I'll usually pick two stocks. So in a year, we'll add eight. What happened is in the last two or two or three appearances we've been in, we cut half the portfolio back because I only want completely bulletproof stocks that in any conditions, and not just that though, but I mean, it's not like IBM. IBM was when we cut, and Intel was when we cut, and Intel was our stock of the year, and IBM was our stock of the year a couple of years ago. We cut them not because there's anything wrong with them, we cut them because we made our money and we're done. But these guys all have a large amount of money still to pay us off, and that's why we're still in it. All right, Robin is asking, is Workhorse a buy? Honestly, I have no idea. I haven't looked at them at all. Um, so do ask me in the chat room. I'm very happy to look it up and find out for you, okay? But um, it's just not something I really know much about. So I have to uh, do a lot of research before I answer that question properly. Uh, what else? Fed. Okay, let's see what the Fed came up with. Um, oh, screw it. Let's just go to the Wall Street Journal. I'm not in the mood to read the Fed minutes. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Inflation, we know. But that's important. By the way, that's, this, is why, this is why I always look at the journal, because you got to see what's on the front page. Okay, so, um, you know, when, 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 when they're putting something on the front page, it's what people are going to be thinking about tomorrow and tonight. Um it's not the obviously not the paper front page, but you can get that somewhere. Somewhere on here you can find that. Oh, print edition. There you go. I always check that too in the morning because I want to see what's actually being. Um, oh, for God's sakes! Anyway, so, you know, this gives you a sense of what they're really talking about. So today, IMF cut growth forecast. That's why we had a little sell-off in the morning. Uh, home sales are falling in China, obviously. Uh, you, you know, okay, home sales are falling in China because you're buying new construction, right? Think about it. You're, you're buying an apartment building, and you're putting a deposit down on an apartment building, um, but it's from Evergreen, and it's not finished yet. So what's your confidence that it's ever going to be finished? Then that's and there's and and half of the home builders are in trouble in, in China at least. So people aren't putting money down on homes. They're not buying any unfinished properties, and that's leaving a lot of crap on the market. Um, 
Yeah, see this logistics boss uh, Baker's job is to save Christmas. Also, very important thing we should all be thinking about. Christmas is going to suck. Joe Biden just had emergency meetings with logistics people um, because Christmas is not going to happen. There's no stuff. It is October and there's no stuff to sell. Black Friday is going to come and there won't be any products to sell people. We are in very bad shape. We have a, and it's not going to get fixed, but what they're doing is they're opening the ports, which are run, you know, government um, oversight things. Um, they're going to have 24, they're going to be open 24 hours a day now. They're trying to catch up because the, the ports are a disaster, a total disaster, and it will take a very long term effort to do this. Now, it's nice to say that you're going to open the ports up 24 hours a day, seven days a week. The problem is you don't have enough people to staff them. So it's going to take more time than we have between now and Christmas to staff up, schedule up, train people, you know, things like that. You, you have to realize these people who they, they put on the ports are in charge. First of all, they have to have security checks. They have to not be not the kind of people who steal things. Um, you have to watch out for that. You have to watch out for people. You need people who are operating cranes that are moving multi-ton uh, containers and taking them off a ship and putting them on a truck. And, and uh, it's, you know, it, it's serious, serious business, like stuff that people can get really badly hurt doing. And you can hurt other people. So you're dealing with heavy machinery, big equipment, um, tight schedules, people doing heavy lifting. It's not like there's an infinite amount of these people sitting around waiting to get hired. Uh, to be longshoremen, and they need, and then they need the truckers to back it up. This is not going to be fixed, even if they have a plan to fix it. It's nice that they have a plan to fix it. It ain't going to happen overnight. It's going to, it, it, it really is not even going to save Christmas. It's, it's going to be very tough and very, and very tricky to get these things going. Um. Okay, and and workers are coming back to the office. So that's that's your quickie headlines off the journal from this morning. So that's those are your golly, stop it. Er, what? <laughs> there we go. Okay, so then you know this is obviously basically when you look at the at the online edition, they're they're more of the mindset of like if I was going to publish the paper this minute, this is what we would put. And it's funny how things fall off. And I always pay attention to that. What, what went on, what went off. So more inflation news. That's from the CPI this morning. Um, and uh, Social Security benefits. Are, and this is going to, and now you think about Social Security is going up 6% officially very shortly. That's going to cause the conversation on inflation to intensify. More people are going to be aware of the fact that inflation is here to stay if the government's giving you 6% boosting your uh, social, social security checks. Um, ah, here we go, here's the Fed. Um, JP Morgan's, uh, oh, and, and see this, now, they, now they're telling you JP Morgan's profit jumped on reserve release. You know why? Because now they have to explain. This morning they didn't say that. Now they have to explain it because why did JP Morgan uh, lose two and a half percent in their stock price if they had such great earnings? Well, the reality is it's because of the reserve release. It has nothing to do with their earnings. Um, Jane J. Booster, blah, blah, blah. Don't care about that. William Shannon was very cool. All right. So, Fed. So, the officials debated timing the mechanics <clears throat> to reduce the tapering. Um, da, da, da. Okay. To begin reducing their bond buying program in November, reviewed plans to begin, they, they have a plan to reduce in November and possibly end it entirely in the middle of next year. That's a pretty aggressive taper. It's 120 billion a month now, middle of next year, there's only gonna be five, six Fed meetings. That's a pretty aggressive tapering. That means they're gonna have to cut 200 billion per two, 20, sorry, 20 billion. They have to cut 20 billion a month per Fed meeting to get to, to get to complete taper. That is an aggressive tapering schedule. I don't think people are looking at that yet. Well, it's, are they looking at that yet? What are the charts saying? That is a much more aggressive than I thought they would be. 
Nope, doesn't seem too affected. Kind of flat. I mean, certainly not, it's not encouraging for the markets, but it's not a big deal. But that is an aggressive tapering schedule. You think about it. If, they, if they're going to cut $120 billion a month between now and middle of next year, that's only six meetings. That's some pretty, that, mean, that means there's going to be some pretty aggressive cutbacks, more so than people are really thinking. Um, but it does say possibly, so you don't know. Um, <laughs> scaling back. The bond purchase is going to keep playing, blah, 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 blah. See, as these bond purchases, like today, we would have had a much worse auction. See, that's the thing. When they pull back, they've got $20 billion less dollars this month to buy bonds with. And that can cause a bad note auction. And if you have a bad note auction, then it puts more upward pressure on, uh, on inflation because the rates start rising and so on and so forth. So you have to be really careful about the repercussions of what they're doing. Um, half of the 18 officials that participated expected the economy to require uh, a rate increase by the end of 2022. In June, seven officials anticipated raising rates this year. Projections also showed several officials expected somewhat higher inflation next year and nearly all penciled in rate increases in 2023. Uh, Post-meeting statement last month included language put notice out that a reduction in bond buying could come as soon as the next meeting. Uh, Powell's uh, said at the conference, rising vaccine rates, $2.8 trillion in federal spending improved since December, has produced a recovery, inflation has soared, uh, blah, blah, blah. Supply chains, materials, all the, all the crap we talk about, separate index. Um, mm -hmm. The Fed cut short its benchmarks to zero. Coronavirus. Uh, here's the thing you got to watch also. And eh, 40 billion mortgage bonds. Powell said last month many officials thought the bond buying program could end by the middle of next year. Uh, somewhat faster time frame the Fed's other experience. Uh, the short period, the economy is further along. Officials eager to conclude the asset buying, uh, given flexibility, raise rates next year. They think inflation may run above the Fed's 2% target. No shit. Officials don't want to be in a position where they're considered a rate increase. Uh, uh -huh. And the Fed laid out a three-part test to raise rates that would require inflation to reach 2% beyond course to exceed that. So they're setting a target, which gives them sort of like a, a data background for them to do this. Um, in December, officials said they would buy bonds at the current pace uh, towards their goal. The Fed's asset portfolio has doubled $8.4 trillion. That is sick. <laughs> that that's that's really debt. That's actually more debt that the country has. The Fed having eight point four trillion dollars of assets on their books is just debt that they bought from us. So instead of being at you know, and if they take a loss, every any loss they take is a loss that goes to the treasury and, and hits our budget. Um, leaving the employment shortfall as a hurdle, the economy at around four point nine million jobs. Blah 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 blah. <sighs> and Powell said, I guess in my own view, that will be the test is all but met. That the test is all but met. So there you are. I mean, that's that's the they are going to start tapering. That's pretty much what that says. They are going to be hitting the tapering. Do you guys see this? It's kind of it, I mean, it's not great. I didn't think it was great. It was just interesting. I mean, to, to see a Korean um show weird uh it wasn't bad it wasn't good it was kind of like hunger games i don't know what everybody's making a big deal of but I, I i think people are just really starved for content at this point well how's netflix doing oh wow look at that i i i, I have to i believe this is peak netflix i think this is silly that's chipotle Ooh, it doesn't look like a bad pullback from here, huh? They, they, they had a, I mean, they, thank God, because we were getting killed in by CNG, and they, they've had a nice little pullback since then. It doesn't look too severe when you look at it on the big picture. Netflix. Oh, come on. I think Netflix has got to be crazy, right? Okay.
Ooh, two thirty already. Here we go. Um, <laughs> gotta get her on call. Let's see. Um, Netflix, Netflix, two hundred seventy-six billion dollars, and they make five billion dollars, and that's during the pandemic. Though this, see, this pop is a very unnatural, right? It's not, I, I really don't think it's likely they're going to keep all these people. I think there's going to be a pullback here, and that's going to hit them pretty hard. But even so, $275 billion, $5 billion in earnings, that is a uh, 50, 50 times? 50, 50 times. Yeah, 50 times earnings. So they're trading at 50 times earnings, and I really think they've super saturated the population, I don't think they're going to grow much more. They're, 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 they're somebody you could short, but it's just too scary. That's the problem. It's just, it's just kind of horrifying to, um, the problem with things like this is the puts are like super expensive. Um, we go, I, I don't know if I want to go to 2024. I think I'm playing for more of a short term thing. So let's say January 23. And if we look down here, they're currently 626, right? So let's say we think they come back 20%. It's not about what you buy, because what's going to happen at any put is if they drop 20%, which is 120 bucks, so let's say they fall 100 bucks. That means that these 500s will go up to the price of the 600s, roughly. And that's up 100%. Meanwhile, the 400s, $17, well, not, you know, 17, will go up to the 500s, which are 38, 100%. So I don't have to buy these to get, I'm going to get the same pop if it happens in the next few months. So if Netflix in the next, in the next two quarters, the next two earnings reports, has a 20% pullback, then you're going to double off of any of these. Now, the 400s are oh, the 417. The 300s are eight, and they're going to go to the price of the 400s, which is more like 17. So honestly, you're going to get more bang for your buck buying the $300 puts. It doesn't matter that it's not going to go to 300. What matters is that when Netflix drops 100 bucks, these guys are going to go up in price very rapidly. They're going to move in bracket effectively. They have a, a nickel. Um, they have a nickel uh, delta, and they're basically going to go up five dollars, which is almost a hundred percent on this thing. You, so, you, so you don't need to buy the big ones now. That since they have a low delta, they're also not going to get hurt too much by Netflix going up. So, they're actually the optimal place to play is probably down around here. Now, you can say, how about the 200s? Because the 200s are only two bucks. And that's true, too. I mean, that, that works as well. But I just think you've got more of a sweet spot here on the threes. I think that, that these can really gain rapidly. And um, they're going to be more liquid also. That's another thing you have to consider is that not many people are going to be buying 200s. I'm not sure how many people are buying 300s. But you can, get them, you can get in and out if you're not greedy. So... That might be fun in the short-term portfolio. Maybe we'll play that. We'll buy some Netflix uh, 300 puts and see what happens in the next two earnings reports. Uh, you know, and if we buy 10 for $7,500 or whatever they go for. So let's say we buy 10 for $7,500. Maybe we'll make $7,500. Maybe we'll lose, but we're not going to lose $7,500. We're going to put a stop on them at, let's say, 4000 So we're only going to risk 3500 we could make seventy five hundred. If there's a really big crash, we'll make ten, fifteen thousand dollars, and that then becomes a nice hedge, since we're only risking four thousand uh, dollars if Netflix keeps going up against that. Now we can offset the four thousand dollars we're risking because we really don't believe it can go much higher, and we could sell. And I wouldn't go that far out to sell, but let's say we sell. January, oh, here you go. So let's say we sell some January 800. Let's say we said, so what do we say we're going to collect? Um, we're going to raise $4,000, right? But let's say we sell five 
January 800s. Now, I super don't believe that Netflix is going to go up $170, 30% between now and January. That seems like stupid, right? So I sell these guys for four bucks each. We sell five of them for $2,000. I was only going to risk $4,000 on the puts. So if I make back 2,000 here and down the road, we make another 2,000, then I've cut my risk down to zero on the $300 puts. And that becomes a wonderful hedge, right? I've cut, I've cut my risk down tremendously and I have ways to, and we have ways to make money. Now, can you get burned? Yes, we got badly, badly burned on Chipotle and we recovered, but at, at one point we were down like 60, $70,000 on Chipotle. You can get very, very badly burned selling short calls against stocks because the worst thing that happens is that the stock goes up and you can't fix it because fixing it means taking either more risk and keeping your bet short or flipping to a bullish position to cover it. But I don't believe in it. I don't, I, I do not in any way, shape or form believe Netflix should be at $800. So how am I going to sit there and spend money to buy a more bullish position at $800 to cover the short calls. So you just end up, you know, painfully riding it out. So you have to be careful about the margin and so on and so forth on that. In the STP, we don't have a problem because we have all that money sitting around in that portfolio and the long-term portfolio. <clears throat> so, uh, oh shit, I gotta go. Um, so I'm gonna get on this call. I'm gonna make it play in chat though for Netflix. And the gist of it's gonna be selling five of these guys, the January, 800 calls for like 450 and then buying 10 so five of those and then buying 10 of the 2023 300 dollars puts for 750. all right so that's going to be it and then and then when those expire we'll sell some more hopefully but if they now of course if, if netflix drops a lot we may just cash it all in we'll see what happens but we'll see what happens with earnings all right, so I'm going to cut it, cut it here, and we are going to um, get some business to take care of, and we'll do this again next week, all right? But thanks, everybody, for coming. Is there any last question? Oh, one question. Jal says, Phil, so now what is the new trade on Viacom? The trade is a trade that's in there. It's perfectly fine. Um, he said, I currently hold uh, $25 puts that were sold for $450, and 37 puts that were sold for something, something for 840 to 10. Well, you know, Viacom's at 40. I wouldn't worry about this at all. I would just let, I, I, the puts I would just leave alone. They're going to expire. The 25 puts are certainly going to expire. Or listen, and then you're left with the 37 puts and hopefully they're going to expire worthless. So I wouldn't worry about that. I, I would add a bull call spread like the one that we have in the portfolio um, because why not, right? Why not take advantage of the upside? But otherwise, I'm very comfortable with that one. All right. Thank you, guys. I got to run and have a lovely uh, day and like nice weekend. All right. Take care.